delighted to see you for the uh, yeah. 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 first talk of the season and very grateful to um, Emily Mayhew for coming along to talk to us about uh, wounded in the in the First World War and the, the book that uh, she's written about it. And if you haven't bought a copy, I'm sure you'll want to at the end of this. Um, and uh, if you're quick and you get one of the ones downstairs, I'm sure Emily would autograph it for you. Otherwise, place an order and we'll get in touch with her and I'm sure she'll oblige by, uh, by autographing it for us. Can I just, uh, before Emily starts, get you looking at the flyer uh, for the next talk. It's quite an interesting title, isn't it, really? Thank you, Reutemann Bush, for bungling the execution. Uh, Leo Aylin is a poet. You can read all about it in there. Um, he's an interesting chap. It should be something totally different, so I hope that you'll really enjoy it. And do go online and look at the rest of the talks for the year, because we have got some really quite interesting talks. But I don't expect any of them are going to be any more interesting <laughs> than the one that Emily is about to go to see. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emily. Thank, Look you. Forward Thank, to you. You. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my, my husband said it's dry January. Everybody will be looking for an excuse to get past Burns Night. Um, with, you know, and, and, and have their mind taken off it. So I, if any of you are doing dry January, I, I know, know that everybody's just shaking their heads at <laughs> <laughs> Happy Burns Night to everyone. Please yeah. turn and say uh, happy Burns Night to the person next to you. Um, so there are two things that you need to understand about me. I am a historian of military medicine and I specialise <laughs> in the study of uh, severe casualty in 20th and 21st century wars. I don't really recognise any wars before 1875, so please don't ask me about Waterloo. Um, I, I really only recognise modern military medicine, or indeed modern medicine, in the modern surgical era. So when we have antisepsis and anaesthetic, surgery starts to look like something that we would recognise today. Anything before that is very haphazard. Um, and it's really two different paradigms that you're talking about. So if you want to hear about the stretcher bearers of Waterloo and the surgeons of Waterloo, you need to get someone else in because that's not me. But I am here to talk about the First World War. And the reason that I have focused on the First World War is because it really is the foundation of our modern military medical system. <laughs> The First World War changed the way we did military medicine. Um, we still do it very much on that model today. And I think, although it's probably massively overstating, but nobody's ever argued with me, <laughs> that it actually changed modern medicine. And the reason is, the subject of my talk, is because of the stretcher bearer core. The stretcher bearer core, as, as most people probably know, stretcher bearers in the army before 1914 were bandsmen. They're quite often people say to me, they stretcher bearers are bandsmen, aren't they? And indeed they were. Or they were, they were people, in the words of one uh, regimental medical officer um, in the RAMC, <coughs> too big or too stupid to do proper soldiering. So they were effectively porters. Or bandsmen. They, and they were bandsmen because they carried big drums and heavy instruments. Um, and the principle of medical treatment was that a, a stretcher bearer would be assigned before a battle and the casualty would be got out and medical treatment would begin when that casualty was brought to the regimental medical officer and not before. So stretcher bearing was quite simply porterage. I'm just going to do it so I can keep an eye on the time. When do you want me to stop? Um, when you finish, really. When I finish, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, we'll can we stop about sort of 7 o'clock and take about 15 minutes of questions? Perfect. Yeah, perfect. <coughs> that was the principle. And then the First World War breaks out and everything changes. There is, we're quite used to a story in Britain of us nobly soldiering on, improvising solutions, and, and, and somehow coming out okay. Battle of Britain won by spitfires and string. Nonsense. We're really quite good at preparing for wars, particularly in the 20th century. And we prepared our military medical system for the First World War as well as it conceivably could have been done. We had a really good generation of regimental medical officers, most of whom had seen action in the colonial wars, particularly South Africa. The army medical services, as it was then, had been comprehensively overhauled. The system worked if you looked at the wounds that had been in inflicted in South Africa in the first decade of the 20th century, 
and on the principle that if you had a military hospital, seven out of ten people in it would have a disease. They would have cholera or typhus or diphtheria, one of the communicable diseases that really accounted for the vast majority of military casualty. Only three out of ten would actually have a wound, and that would either have killed them on the battlefield or be relatively straightforward to, to treat. All of that is swept out of the way by the end of the first three months of the First World War. By the time the first trenches are dug, by the time the Western Front, as we will come to know it, has run from the French coast to the Alps, to the Swiss Alps. And by the time they realise that industrial warfare is going to bring down far more men than they thought they originally thought and they originally planned for, and that when you looked at a military hospital in December 1914, 10 out of 10 in the hospital were there with very severe wounds. They did adapt remarkably quickly. Uh, the Army Medical Services was led by Alfred Keogh, and I'm from Imperial College in London, and Alfred Keogh was our rector. Uh, he'd retired from the AMS, um, I, in, in, I think in about, in about 1900, um, having comprehensively reformed it. He was our first volunteer for war service from Imperial. I mean, it was the minute he skipped out of Imperial. He was about the same size as me, and we had the same feet, and Quite often, people at Imperial want me to wear a Keo costume. Fortunately, there isn't a Keo costume, otherwise I'd be standing here in it. He was enormously punchy, and alongside Arthur Sloggett, who he sent out to France, they were ready to reform the system with whatever was needed. The principle that they both understood, one doesn't really understand why, because, because Keo is really, a, he's really a, a process man, a logistics man, but what they really understood was that medical care was going to have to move from that point where the regimental medical officer gave it after the bodies had been carried out to the point of wounding. Modern military medicine is the, about care at the point of wounding. It's about casualty evacuation, but it's about care at the point of wounding. It's about taking your capability as far forward as it will go, as far forward as it can be supported and best of all, to the point of wounding. And this is the point at which the stretcher bearer corps is re entirely reconceived into what today we would call the modern paramedics. Stretcher bearers are, vo they are recruited, stretcher bearer corps are volunteered, there are very few conscripts, you're given the option to go into the stretcher bearer corps later on in the war. But the early, the first official <coughs> stretcher bearer corps were all volunteers. And they had to be men with a bit of stuff about them, the other, the RMO said. They needed to have a bit of gumption, a bit of initiative. They didn't need to have a great deal of education, but they needed to be teachable. And one of the things that they're going to be taught, and again, this is really where medicine, one of those pivots where medicine changes. They're going to be taught, because it is now understood, that control of hemorrhage is going to be everything. And they are going to be the first people, without a medical degree, to be taught to control hemorrhage. How the medical profession didn't object to that violently, I don't really understand. Because normally, when you dilute the medical profession's capability, there's a great lessons to the Lancet and the VMA, well, it didn't exist at that point, whatever, the Royal College of Surgeons, heading to Downing Street to, pro to protest bitterly. But the need was so very great, within six weeks of the war, it was understood that at point of wounding, whoever gets to the casualty first must be able to control hemorrhage. And that will be the principle on which the stretcher bearer corps is founded, and what makes them different from everything that's gone before. So the, the first uh, corpsmen are recruited, they are, and they are then taken for six weeks training at the, what I always call, confusingly named Cambridge Hospital in Aldershot. Um, for six, I mean, it's really what we're thinking. Um, uh, and I see my students writing it down, and you know they're going to go back and go, oh, Cambridge, which one is it? And it must be Cambridge, because Cambridge is a university. Um, it's now, I think, a, a, well, it's now going to be a housing development, except that I think it was being done by Carillion, so nobody's working on it. That's another story. They went for six weeks to the Cambridge to, for the training call, and they were taught everything. They were taught uh, 
the control of hemorrhage. They were taught first aid, they were taught uh, the improvisation of splinting, they were taught dressings. They were introduced to what the casualties they were going to handle looked like. The worst casualties were brought on trains to the Cambridge Hospital. And the trainee bearer corps were used to unload them from the, from the train carriages, put them on ambulances and get them up to the ward. That was really the first time that they learned how hard what they call, ended up calling the carry was going to become. That you're getting a man down from a great height who's in a great deal of pain and that you must get him down and carry him carefully and take him up the stairs of the hospital and make sure that he gets to the right place and to the right ward. Those are skills enough in themselves, but they are also learning this groundbreaking, this paradigm shift of the control of hemorrhage. They're also made fit. It's assumed that the, they're going to be carrying at least a 10 stone weight. Um, a, a 10 stone weight with, and I have never done any work on, on uh, the fitness of recruits and what the average weight was at this point in the war, although presumably it changes. But a 10 stone weight, possibly as much as 12 stone, if you have a great coat that has, has absorbed a lot of water, either from a trench or from, from bad weather. So it's very hard work, and they go and train up on Box Hill. Uh, they have to get all the way up to the top of Box Hill with their stretcher and then all the way down again. And if you don't know where Box I'm sure most people know where Box is, where Bradley Wiggins, you know where it is. Yeah. <laughs> But the most important lessons come when they learn to control hemorrhage, when they are taught that it will be them that will treat the bleeding uh, of the casualty, will treat the beginning of the wounds that they've seen coming off the railway carriages. The really important thing about this is they are not allowed, they are not taught, and indeed they are discouraged from using tourniquets. Um, and indeed, I think it's probably fair to say that the tourniquet debate was unresolved until about 2006. Is that all right? I think the last angry letter from an RMO to the Journal of the Royal Army Medical Corps saying tourniquets are tremendously dangerous, you know, you really should use them with more care. We, don't, we tend not to think of them, of, of them now. But tourniquets in 1914 were seen as possibly threatening the limb that they were being wrapped around. Of course, that they do. But we now understand the tourniquet as being something that isn't about saving the limb, it's about saving the life. So they are not taught to control hemorrhage with tourniquets, instead they're taught to control it with direct pressure. They gather up the field dressings of the soldiers around them and the stock that they have in their panniers, and they press down on the bleed until it stops. If it doesn't stop, they maintain that pressure, becoming a sort of human tourniquet whilst the patient is eventually loaded up and moved out off the battlefield. That's where, this is my job as a military historian, to explain what that means. It is amusing to think that a hundred years later we still didn't, we hadn't really resolved that until we went to Afghanistan and IEDs rang out across the landscape and we knew all over again that tourniquets are for saving lives, not so much limbs. But it's really quite an important decision uh, when we think about the development of stretcher bearers as prototype paramedics. Because by, the, by denying them the tourniquet, they can't put on a tourniquet and then attend to the other injuries, which is what you do with tourniquets. They have to attend to that wound all the time. Either they're applying constant pressure as they walk along, or they are monitoring the man on the stretcher to see if the wound has started to bleed again. They have to be aware of colour, they have to be aware of respiration, they have to be aware if he's slipping out of, in and out of consciousness, if his speech is becoming slurred. This is a medical, that they're making the process of the carry, of the evacuation, mm -hmm. medical. And from about mid-1915, when you read stretcher bearer writings, they say, we had a patient on the stretcher. They see this journey as the first point in the medical process. The fact that they can only use field dressings to control hemorrhage means that this is a highly medicalized process. And they have become a very particular form of medic because they can monitor that patient until they're turned over either to the regimental medical officer or, as the war draws on, to the field hospitals that will come closer and closer to the Western Front. And I should, as a sideline, I was explaining this the other day, and, I, and I, I generally talk to a lot of military medics. We talk about tourniquets, we talk about the combat application tourniquet, or we talk about the CAT, 
And quite often I forget and I talk about cats. I was talking to a very large group, Western Front enthusiasts. I was talking about whacking on a couple of cats and getting on with the other injuries. And I see really alarmed people in the front going, where did the cats come from? What are they doing? Are they clutching the leg? Is this, is this not cruel? Is it animal therapy? No, I'm sorry. If, if, please wave if I say, if I, I, I try very hard not to use um, um, military acronyms, mainly because I don't mostly know what they mean. But I do understand the cat. But I'm going to some trouble to explain the tourniquet. But a tourniquet is, is an extraordinary piece of equipment and even more extraordinary when it's not there because it requires a new and very enhanced range of skills. So medical treatment starts by the stretcher bearer corps at the point of wounding and it's emphasised to them that they will treat at the point of wounding until the casualty is strong enough to be moved. This means that the decision to move them and the, the decision who to move first is in their hands. This is triage. And this is a complicated set of decisions to make for people who don't have a medical degree, who may only have been educated until they're 15. And nobody realised the extent to which they were going to have to make these decisions until the war unfolds, until it rolls out with its hundreds and thousands of casualties. These are decisions that are made at the point of wounding by the stretcher bearer corps. And it's an extraordinary and, well, an untold development. Not untold, I'm doing my best. <laughs> it's been my job during 2014 to 2018 to rush anywhere that will have me and shout, pay attention to the stretcher bearers. Um, and uh, if I've done nothing else, I've really tried to do that. We're into 2018 now, and I'm starting to think I'm sure the First World War felt really hard to the people who fought it. But for those of us who are commemorating it, oh my God, will it never be over. Um, uh, but it, it very nearly is. And then I shall miss being asked to come and talk to nice, full room, nice warm, full rooms of people. So the stretcher bearers uh, gather the patient up onto their, onto their stretcher, and then they begin to make the journey back first to the aid post, the regimental aid post, where the regimental uh, medical officer may be waiting, and then eventually back <coughs> to the field hospital. At the same time as the stretcher bearer corps are being developed, as the same time as they're arriving out in France, that principle of bringing capability to the point of wounding bringing it as far forward as it can, will go and can be supported, is being brought up from the other end. The field hospitals that are created in France in, during 1915 look very much like the big hospitals at home. It's understood that these casualties cannot wait. They cannot be put in ambulances and have a four or five hour journey to the big general hospitals that have been created uh, on the coast in Boulogne and in Calais. Vimera, all, all the way up and down the British section of the coast. Instead, the capability inside those hospitals is moved as far forward as it will go. And the field hospitals end up looking like, well, field hospitals used to. Very long lines of tent with, with, with the, the full range of expertise that you're going to need to treat people who've had enormous big holes in them, blown into them. <coughs> Everything from radiology to laboratories, there is a resus ward, a pre-operative ward, obviously an operative ward, and a post-op ward. And we see that by the, the, uh, by the time of the Somme, by the, by the uh, time of the conscription of the great mass armies of 1916, that this is a, a, a developed field hospital system that looks very like the modern, uh, our, our modern equivalents. It's a system that's capable of bringing to those hospitals exactly what is needed. And I remember reading about when the CT scanner was brought to Bastion. Um, and this was a big deal. This was the CT scanner. This was the first time they'd ever had a CT, a CT scanner in field hospital. Very big deal. It was, it's always with very considerable pleasure that I address senior military medics and say, yes, I'm sure it was very exciting. But I can assure you that when the first mobile radiological laboratory in a van driven by Marie Curie was brought to a field hospital in the First World War, that had considerably more impact and was, in fact, the first point at which developed scanning had been brought into a field setting. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Marie Curie uh, conceived this idea. She's a, a fantastic woman scientist. She got a Nobel Prize for Raw. Um, but what she really did was, at the outbreak of the First World War, say what the, these kind of injuries, the, the shrapnel injuries, the, the 
um, shell fragments that are left in human bodies, you're going to need to be able to see those. You, uh, you can't do surgery improvising. And she bought 12 little Renault vans um, and learned how to drive, learned how to change a tire and strip down an engine. And she took her laboratory assistants from Paris and she converted these vans into mobile radiology labs and she drove them out to the front. Some of them were French hospitals, some of them were Belgian, some of them were British. And she said, would you like a radiological laboratory? And most of them said, oh, yes, please. Would you, would you either unload it from your van and run it yourself, um, or would you leave it here and we'll run it? Uh, occasionally, she stayed. She actually stayed at the field hospital. There were, there were occasions where she wasn't allowed in the operating theatre because surgeons wouldn't have women in their operating theatre. <laughs> so she used to have to go up to the door and wave and say, I've got, I've got the film of this, of, of this patient's hand, and somebody would come and collect it. But she didn't, she didn't really mind, and she had work to do, and we've moved on. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an, again, an extraordinary story of the First World War that deserves to be better known, although the current exhibition in the Science Museum has a nice piece about it. If you're ever up in the Science Museum and you find yourself with time after you've seen the dinosaurs, come up to the Science Museum and see Wounded, which is on until June, and which has the story of medical care at the Somme. But I'm going to go back to the stretcher bearers now and to the range of capability that they learn as they carry every patient that they carry every day of the war. Six weeks training doesn't seem like very much, but they are told that they'll have six weeks uh, in England, and then when they go out, the remainder of their training will be completed by the RMO to whom they are assigned. And the RMO is told to give at least one lecture a week, and that it should be neither skipped nor rushed, not even if it's in the middle of a battle. This very quickly stops being a teaching space. Everything on the Western Front that the casualties, that the, the, the medical system has to deal with <coughs> is new. As the stretcher bearers learn, the RMOs learn. And the soldiers learn that the RMO may be the doc, he may be the person that takes their sick parade, uh, but that the stretcher bearers are of equal importance. And it's a culture change that we accept now. We accept that if you're in an emergency, you want a paramedic. You don't want a GP coming limping down the road saying, I'll see what I can do. I'll see if I can remember bandaging from medical school. You want a properly trained paramedic with their nice bag of kit. But it takes a long time for that cultural <coughs> shift to happen, particularly on the Western Front. The very first stretch of error calls there are uh, men that are assigned, when they move out into the frontline trenches, when they're waiting to go over the top, they're at the back of the trenches, during the, uh, particularly during 1915, it gets much better after 1916, and they're being jostled by the soldiers who are there, and the soldiers say, get a rifle, do some proper fighting. And then the whistles blow, and the ladders go up, and the soldiers go out, and the stretcher bearers <coughs> wait, and some of them wrote that they counted to 20, and then they pull the ladders back and go over the top themselves and listen for the screams. One of the things that they had to learn to deal with, what we would call a soft skill now, <laughs> is to find a man who might have disparaged them while they were waiting in his nervousness, and who then, when they come up and meet him, are crying and very distressed because they feel very guilty. And the first thing that they all learn is to say, it doesn't matter, I've heard it before, it doesn't hurt me, don't worry about it, be quiet and let's get on. And then they bandage his wounds, and they assess his casualty, and if he's strong enough to be moved, and then they move him. The t during this time, everybody's learning about the potential for this role, for the idea of bringing medical skill, not a medical degree, but medical skill, to the point of wounding. And more and more things are left up to them. You start seeing towards the end of 1915, stretcher bearers being allocated morphine supplies being given control of pain, of analgesia. And they first, in the first part of the war, they get little tins of blue, of blue morphine tablets. And in the second part of the war, smaller um, syringes, which they can give individual doses of morphine. The ones that they have, are the, the, the little tins of tablets, uh, are, are supposed to be put under the tongue so that they can be dissolved and go in straight through the bloodstream. It's a fentanyl lozenge, really. Um, nothing really changes, you know, nothing ever really changes. Um, but one of the things that they learn is, in fact, if you're carrying a patient back and he may start to bleed again, his wounds may become bad enough for you to have to stop and control that hemorrhage, you don't want him to be unconscious. A dead weight is a weight who can't tell you that his leg hurts again 
or that he suddenly got a very bad pain in his head. And as the field hospitals get closer, uh, they also, when the likelihood that surgery will be done between one, two, or three hours of coming off the battlefield, you also don't want a patient who's drugged up to the eyeballs, because it's going to interfere with the pretty brutal but existing anaesthetics that are available that day. So stretcher bearers get, although they have the power of analgesia, they get used to withholding it. They get used to negotiating with the patient on their stretcher. And they say, can you wait 10 minutes? Can we see how you go? Can we, let's just talk what, as we go along, tell me where the pain is, and, and, and maybe if it gets really bad, I'll give you medication, but it'd be much easier if you don't have it. A very wise man once told me, and I wrote it in my book about Afghanistan, that really good pain treatment starts with a question. Uh, it starts with a really good pay, uh, pain treatment is always underpinned by a conversation. And the stretcher bearers of the First World War would have told him, yes, obviously, uh, had they still been here today. Really good pain treatment starts with a conversation, understanding what is needed and what's going to be relevant going forward. And one of the things that the stretcher bearer, where, they, where they, there is an elision between their allocation of morphine and the decisions that they make about who they're going to treat and bring home, is in as they assess who they aren't going to bring home and who they're going to leave. Stretcher bearers, it's a very hard decision. They'll move who's strong enough, but quite often they realise that whoever is lying at the torn to pieces at the bottom of the shell hole may still be alive, but they won't make it up to the rim. They won't make it onto the stretcher. Most of the time they're unconscious, but some of the time those men will say to them, no, leave me, go with someone who has some hope. And so, if necessary, it is a stretcher bearer, the stretcher bearers take it upon themselves to leave them with the last of their morphine, or to give them the injections that will make sure that the last moments of their life will be pain-free, or as pain-free as possible. And that is simply something that they feel they need to develop. There's no part of the training course for that. That is something that they are obliged to do by their presence at the point of wounding, because sometimes it's the point of killing. And they have to make sure they take upon themselves the responsibility for making that process as easy as possible. And stretcher bearers wipe very movingly of giving a last injection on their knees and then sitting back on their heels and waiting for the patient to fade away. And if the patient's awake, they send them off. They, send them, they tell them to go, to get going, to get going with the people who can be saved. So one of the other things that's always kept in a stretcher bearer's pannier is in his oil skin, with his map, are a packet of cigarettes and a packet of matches so that they can leave a, the, the, the dying man with a, a last cigarette to smoke. I have spoken to audiences who look horrified at that. <laughs> um, but it's, it's the World War, you, sh you might as well smoke. And things never really change. I was just at a, a conference for INGOs, and I was talking to someone from the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross, who's running big program offices in Syria and Libya, uh, dealing with blast injury victims, I was talking about this kind of stuff, actually. And he said, well, it's a very difficult decision, he said, because the ICRC policy is as a completely <laughs> non-smoking environment. <laughs> he said, but it's very difficult to say someone in Lepo, when they come in wanting to have help from your program, please do you mind putting your cigarette out, because the ICRC is a non-smoking environment. And he had this earnest Swissness about him. <laughs> and I thought, wow, nothing really ever changes. <laughs> if it's a world war or one of the worst urban conflicts ever seen, let people smoke. In fact, smoke. <laughs> it's going to make everybody's life easier. That's the kind of range of skills that stretcher bearers are having to develop. Saving a life, in trying to make a, a life that is already lost as easy in its last moments as possible. And these are the kind of things that they don't write about. They, stretcher bearers are very bad at writing letters and diaries. They don't come from the class of people that write poetry. Um, they write the odd letter home, if they keep a diary, it tends to have things in it like, the, well, I saw the king from a distance, he looks very kingly. It doesn't say, and today I went out three times um, and I brought people back in almost constantly under fire. Stretcher bearers, I think, receive, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's 13 VCs. They are recognised for what they do during the First World War, even though we have lost sight, and we lost sight very quickly of this level of achievement. 
in the official British medical history of the war, which is written by surgeons, there is no mention of stretcher bearers. There is one, the phrase is used once in relation to portraying in Cameroon, but there is no mention. There's a volume for every different kind of surgery, but there's nothing about stretcher bearers. There wasn't a recognition at the time that the, the reason that field hospitals could be brought forward to operate on casualties is because the casualties were still alive, and they were still alive because of this extraordinary capability. I'm just checking my work. Okay. Oh, oh, good. Yeah, well, um, good. Then good. 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 stop, then stop. Oh, no, exactly. Okay. Uh, because of this extraordinary capability. But that was a little too far to ask a surgeon to go, to say not only, well, my capability monumentally diluted, it was with enormous success. Um, and it will be transformational for medicine in the modern era. Um, one can only ask so much of a surgeon, and that really was... I'm sorry, do we have a lot of surgeons in the room? <laughs> I should really check that more often. I have a pro-surgeon version of this history. Which is <laughs> yeah, honestly. I, the, and the nurses, one, nurses are also good. Um, but I always say, you give me a decent paramedic and a decent physio, and I can, save any, I can get them to save anyone. But I can replace a surgeon with a robot and pack it off in a drone, and we'll still be the same. <laughs> but I don't say that at the Royal College of Surgeons. Also <laughs> what else do stretcher bearers do? They learn to live out at the front. Um, they are the people who are in the front line longer than anyone else. Their, their shifts, their rotors, are last considerably longer than soldiers that go up into the front line. It's always the thing when you talk to schools, when they always think that the entire mass of young, the flower of British youth, moved to the Western Front, stayed there for four years. Of course they don't. They're for, they're for about three days at a time, she said, looking around in a room, you know, better than I do. And then they come back. They are rotating through the frontline trenches. This is really not the case for the medics. Medics spend a long time in the front line. They go up before, they, they are the first people to know uh, when the battles are planned. They go up before and plan, the, uh, repair the trenches, get trenches that can't take a stretcher going around the corner, um, uh, rebuild them. Uh, uh, straighten them out, clear them out of rubble, and set up the various aid dumps. Before the Somme, there was a great deal of this done, because they understood by then that you could set up your aid post, you could know where it was, and then one, one explosion from a large <coughs> artillery shell would not only take it out, but it would destroy your ability to understand that it had gone, because the other uh, trenches had, had been destroyed, and the pathway that you had understood had, all, had been wrecked. The landscape had been transformed. So you have to use your experience as a stretch of error to site your dumps, to draw a map with your regimental medical officer, and make sure everybody in your team has got one so everybody knows where they're going. A month into the Somme, frequently bearers brought back patients, and the line had completely gone from where they had gone out from, or it had moved, and it was simply impossible to orient themselves. And so they went into whatever hole they could find, and they set up an aid post, and they ran it until somebody found them. They, they became, they had become the face of the medical system, and by the end of 1915, there isn't any more jostling in the trenches. In fact, soldiers know when they join their regiment in France that they must go and find the RMO, but even more importantly, they must go and find the bearer team leader, and they must introduce themselves and shake hands and make sure the bearer team leader has seen them, because if he hasn't, God knows they won't, he won't find them. His men won't find them if they're brought down. It becomes almost a, a talismanic event. You must find the bearers, and they must know who you are, so they can look for you if you fall. Bearers aren't armed. That's something that I always get asked. They aren't armed. I don't think that medics were armed until the 21st century. It's <coughs> up to them. I'm looking at the medic in the room. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, they're certainly not armed during the Great War, although at, in Passchendaele particularly, I get this thing because it's war horse and it makes life easier. Passchendaele <laughs> in particular, we know that RMOs and stretcher, uh, and stretcher bearer team leaders carry small arms uh, in order to put horses out of their misery that, and mules out of their misery that are drowning in shell holes. This is a particular feature of, of correspondence back from Passchendaele. Um, and they're not going to use it to, to engage the enemy, but they are going to use it to put um, mule, animals out of their misery. 
animals become a big point of stretcher bearers life it's a cheap trick to play i'm going to tell you a pet story on the western front now but it's <laughs> no less true for that bearers are near the front line they have their own tent they have their own community and they usually attract a community of pets very large towns and villages are emptied in france and when people leave they let, quite often left their pets behind and so animals ended up going wherever wherever there was anybody to find and most bearer teams had a little scruffy sort of dog. Uh, they have a great picture uh, in the Science Museum of a, of a scruffy kind of pit bull terrier with a bandaged <coughs> paw, and it's like, <gasps> the whole war is there. I can show that picture to school children I've gotten for the next couple of hours. <laughs> um, and the comfort, it is that old story of the comfort that animals bring human being in their relationships when they write home. One of them, I, and I have this story in wounded, one of them uh, writes home, that they found a little dog in the bottom of a shell hole um, and he was absolutely dripping in mud and, you, and they took him back to their tent and when their shift was over they cleaned him, they bought cotton wool in and they, and they cleaned his little eyes up and he turned out to be a really nice little white Jack Russell type dog. And they thought, how fantastic, we'll keep him. How could anybody have, have left this poor little dog to drown in a shell hole? And the minute they opened their tent, he shoots out finds a puddle and rolls around it <laughs> because he has learned that being a neat little white Jack Russell on the Western Front is a really bad idea <laughs> that people will use you for target practice. And, uh, and so they give up and they call him Mud. They acknowledge their failure in this and they call him Mud and he lives with them until they are all gone. And they ask their families to send out special allocations of food to feed mum. Uh, tins of anchovies in particular. I, I remember thinking, whoa, this is a dog that liked anchovies. But again, there was a war on. He probably smoked. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great to see the comfort and, and the attention that they pay. There's a stretcher bearer who writes that whenever the bombardments start in no and the shells start to fall in no man's land inside his dugout, moles come shooting out of the walls. I wish my dad had known this. My dad was always trying to find a way of getting rid of moles. And it turns out that what you really need is very large artillery in <laughs> one. In which case, moles go in the opposite direction. And they said they would drop out, you know, 10 or 20 moles at a time. And there was nothing to be done except move your dugout. All of that... All of those skills, all of that, the life that they led is done against a background of an increasingly heavy physical toll that bearing takes on them. Bearers are much in demand if they come from northern regiments, particularly regiments where there are a lot of miners who've joined up. And they are in demand for a number of reasons. Firstly, they're very good at mining. It's The clue is in the title. They're very good at digging. Um, they're very good at straightening trenches and expanding medical officers' dugouts and digging aid posts where, wherever it's required. One uh, RMO had his, his minor, his Durham minor battalion, would dig him fireplaces in his dugouts, which he thought was in extraordinarily <coughs> impressive. Um, but also because <coughs> miners came from an industry where they were used to casualty. I am always interested when people talk to me about 15-year-old boys who join up in the Western Front, who lie about their age and join up. Frequently, they come from mining communities. They come from Wales, they come from Durham, they come from Scotland. They come from parts of the world where the alternative when you were a 15-year-old boy was to go down the pit. And going down the pit meant you probably did already know two or three hundred people who died a gruesome death. So it's from those communities that people come because this looks like a better option. You also have quite high levels of training within a mining, uh, within the mining industry uh, in occupational and first aid for your fellow miners. So people come, there is a predisposition towards uh, mining regiments within the stretch of Eric Hall because they've already had the training and they want to build upon it. The 15-year-old boys that come, there's one that I talk about particularly in the book that comes out, and he's very tall, and he's going to be 16, and they need the bearers, so they leave him there. Although he's like all 15-year-old boys, he's really hungry all the time. The other bearers give him their rations, because he's always looking for food. And he knows that the alternative is to go back and be in a mine. Um, and by then, mining is a prescribed uh, occupation because they need the miners, and he prefers to be out on the Western Front. And he talks in letters home about how when they're moving very large, very delicately manufactured shells, they call stretcher bearers out from their regiments to do it. Because they're used to carrying heavy things really carefully. 
So when they have these really big shells with really delicate mechanisms, it's the bearers that they're going to use for that. And he's in his 16-year-old boy way, he comments on the irony of what it is they're required to carry. By 1916 and the arrival of the mass conscript army, this is an extraordinarily efficient medical system, and it looks like what we have today, what we aspire to set up today if we deploy <coughs> Uh, it, you have a field hospital with as full range of capabilities as possible, as close to the front line. And they become enormous. It takes 50 lorries to move them. And into 1917 once, and, and 1918, once the great German counter-offensives begin, these hospitals are frequently overrun because it's just too difficult to move them. Uh, they're frequently overrun and the Germans leave their casualties behind. And then when they're pushed back, those casualties become prisoners of war. Bearers get very good at dealing with all things German. They all learn a bit of pidgin German. And the reason that they do is because they're going to have to deal with German prisoners of war, but also because German medical kit is vastly better than <laughs> British medical kit. Um, the, the Science Museum uh, exhibition has a lot of German medical kit in it. And when I went along to, uh, to help them with planning, when I say help them, I mean tell them that this has to be a lot about stretcher bearers and don't worry about the rest of it, which I'm delighted to say it mostly is. Um, uh, I, they, they said, we must have had some German people who left us stuff, because it, it looks like we've got a lot of German medical kit. The priority for stretcher bearers, when their battalion overran the German trenches, was to say, please go and get me any kit that you can get, particularly, and on such things, lives are won and lost, the sticky bandage. The German pharmaceutical industry had produced the stick on the sticky bandage, which, like we have plasters today, that can be stuck and unstuck repeatedly. We still had field dressings, actually we still have field dressings, <laughs> um, which are a pad and a really pretty useless long uh, wing of, of linen that was, you can imagine, is almost impossible to, uh, to administer and apply usefully uh, in a battle scenario. If you had reels of German sticky bandage, that was really handy. We, again, it's part of our national narrative that you know, we're never very well prepared for war, but somehow we tie up our spitfires with a string and we win it anyway. Um, but there was a real concern at the beginning of the war that we were going to be, we'd become extremely dependent on the German, particularly pharmaceutical industry. And we needed to replace that uh, if we were going to <coughs> war with the Germans. I think we went to war with the Germans, still not quite believing it wasn't the French. Uh, if you go into the archives, if you go into the archives and you look at the military exercises, pretty much up to the first of August, 1914, they are for tackling uh, a French army, not a German one. It must have been inordinately difficult for your older type of officer that they were facing the great, really, what had been uh, comrades in arms. Particularly difficult for the medical uh, profession. Medics, uh, every, almost all medics that went out at RMO level had really quite good German. It was considered essential for your career, if you were a modern man, that you would do a fellowship either in Berlin uh, or in Vienna. There were strong professional ties, and we were dependent on them for a number of things. Our morphine supplies, for instance, and particularly our X-ray films. I think it was still, it was called VASF then, but we got all our X-ray films from Germany. And these were capabilities that we had to develop uh, during the war and pretty quick. Uh, there was a doctor that wrote a letter to the Lancet saying, we're going to have a problem, particularly with analgesia, particularly with morphine. We get almost all our morphine from Germany. I urge you, my colleagues, to start growing poppies in your garden without delay. <laughs> <laughs> and please harvest them and make morphine and send it out to the front because our boys are going to need it. In fact, the, the story of how the British pharmaceutical in industry manages to learn to synthesise and distribute that morphine during the First World War is one of the great unsung stories. Germany, on the other hand, the economic blockade worked. And if you have a naval historian here, and I see no reason to do that, um, <laughs> if you have a naval historian here, they will tell you that the First World War, the Western Front, was entirely unnecessary, and it could all have been won if we just had the blockade up firmer. What it did mean is that German medical supplies had diminished by the end of 1917, so that historians think they had no analgesia in the front line for the, the whole of 1918 throughout their offensives they certainly were considerably hindered. And at that point, although there was a constant concern about replenishment of shells, uh, British medical, the, the entire system, both supply, process, and practice, was really working very well. 
Um, by 1918, the field hospitals are models of, of medical care. Where else do we find stretcher bearers? We find them in very... So you have to look now. That's really what I, I come into a room and I say, stretcher bearers, look for them. When you're going through your family diaries, when you're up in the attic, getting down the, the letters and the record keeping by your family from that period, please look for the stretcher bearers. This was how I found a very unusual a place that stretcher bearers, even more unusual than them carrying the large bombs. There were stretcher bearers at every execution. A party of stretcher bearers was called forward because they were going to be the people that undid the ropes from the soldier that had been executed and carry the body away. And stretcher bearers quite rightly, bitterly resented this duty. There's a very nice, uh, uh, there's a very nice uh, reproduction of the stretcher bearer diary, which I think is called Bearers Up. And they tell a story of a bearer unit that had a very young bearer who was about 17 in their unit, and he was the people that that. Uh, organized the executions, that organized the courts martial and the execution, uh, were, were not the favorite uh, people out on the Western Front. And this was a particularly uh, disliked officer who was in charge of the execution. And the young boy, the soldier, was brought in, hooded and tied to the stake. And the young stretcher bearer didn't want to look, and he turned his head away. And this officer turned the, the boy's head and said, you will look, and if you do not look, you'll be on field punishment number one by sunset. And as the, uh, the firing party loaded up their guns, the, the young stretcher bearer was copiously sick all over the officer, <laughs> to the enormous ratification of the bearing body. Um, and they recorded a whole paragraph on it in their diary. These are the things that really count. But they then had to step forward and untie the ropes and loosen the body of the executed man, uh, load him up onto a stretcher and take him to a tent nearby because there was always pathology done in the field on people who had been executed. So that's an unexpected place. Whenever a soldier has to be carried for any reason, it is usually a stretcher bearer, so pay attention to that. Our problem is, as I've said, that they don't write very much. Um, they, the few sources, I gather a source every now and then. I learn who gets my books for Christmas because... <laughs> About now, I'm like, it's mid-Feb, I get letters saying, I got wounded for Christmas. Um, and I was thinking, wow, somebody looked at a book about horrible suffering on the First World War book. I know who that's a perfect present for. Um, <laughs> generally, my publishers always say to me, your, your books come out in March, Emily, they're not a Christmas purchase. Um, but fortunately, sometimes they are. Um, I had a, a fantastic letter from a man whose father had been a stretcher bearer on the Western Front. And he said, of course, he never talked about it. Um, and he never talked about it. He said, however, we knew there was more to it because we could see the marks on his body. He had scars on his back from where carrying a stretcher, carrying a shoulder, uh, carrying a strap over his shoulder, had worn a, a scar into his, into his back. But mainly he could tell from his hands. You could always tell a stretcher bearer by his hands. They had wooden handles. And in cold or wet or hot, gloves were difficult to keep, and gradually bearers' hands blistered and, and were damaged and eventually scarred into something like leather. Stretcher bearers used something called Melrose cream, which you can still get on Amazon, actually. It's like, a, it's like a um, medicated Vaseline. And he said, my father used it every day, every day. He said, I associated that with him. And he would stand there talking to me, and he was rubbing the cream into his hands. Because, and he lived until he was in his mid-90s, so yay. Um, and he said, that is this, and I never understood why, and he wouldn't tell me, and now I do. And that's, that's a very good <coughs> sense to get. We otherwise don't know very much of what happened to them. Um, they certainly didn't come back and form the paramedic corps. They didn't come back and start an ambulance corps. They, some of them went and worked in hospitals, but th their, their achievements weren't recognised, and they didn't necessarily recognise them either. Very occasionally you see references to them. I think there was, I think there's a, an Agatha Christie book where a character says, for example, where Hercule Poirot asks if he minds looking at the body and the character says, I was a stretcher bearer in the First World War, so no, I don't mind at all. So they are in that consciousness, but the understanding of what they did, the understanding <coughs> of their work, was by and large lost for about a century. We don't know the cost that stretcher bearing took. We know some of the physical costs. We know very little of the psychological costs, simply because I don't have enough records to make a statement. However, I was lecturing at the Imperial War Museum, and my husband 
came in a taxi to come and hear me. He's a good man. Um, <laughs> and he was in the taxi, and the taxi driver said, uh, what are you doing? Uh, you, know, you, know, think, you know, comedy London taxi driver, Cockney accent now. What are you doing? He said, I'm going to hear my wife. She's giving uh, a lecture about the First World War. And the taxi driver said, oh, uh, I, I'll tell you, my great uncle was in the war, and he, I'll tell you what he did, and I bet you won't know anything about it. He said, he was a stretcher bearer. <laughs> and my husband said, oh, dear God almighty, I've had nothing but stretcher bearers for the last four years. <laughs> And he told him about wounded, and the guy went on Amazon, not sadly his local independent bookshop, but a sale was a sale, um, went and ordered it while they were driving through Kennington. And then my husband dropped him off, and my husband was paying, and he said, oh, can I ask what happened to your great uncle? And the taxi driver said, oh, yes, that was interesting. He got through the whole of the song without a scratch, and then he came home, and on his second day of leave, he went up to his bedroom and he shot himself. Oh. And this was the first time that I had heard of that. And that's what I remember when I think about stretcher bearers. You should remember their extraordinary work, but also their extraordinary <coughs> sacrifice. And that they're the last great untold story of the First World War. And it's, it has been my honour to come and tell people. So thank you very much for having me. Mm, Questions? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Um, one category of stretcher bearer you didn't mention, I think, was conscientious objectors. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and talking of decorations, mm -hmm. the most highly decorated, non-commissioned person of the First World War was Lance Corporal William Coltman of the North Staffordshire Regiment, mm -hmm. who had mentioned in dispatches Croix de Guerre. Distinguished Conduct Medal and Bar, mm -hmm. Military Medal and Bar, and Victoria Cross. Absolutely. He never carried a weapon mm -hmm. and he never fired a shot because he was a Plymouth Brethren. I think it's a guess that about 30% <coughs> of stretcher bearers are conscientious <coughs> objectors. And what's particularly interesting is that the Quakers themselves uh, developed their own training program. Um, it's at Didcot, <coughs> out at Didcot, and the various conscientious objectors, particularly who, who come from the religious orders, um, the various conscientious develop their own program based on the Aldershot program. So you sh you should assume <coughs> that when I'm talking about bearers, I'm talking about 30% conscientious objectors because it wouldn't have run without them. Um, that would have been a, too significant a number, I think, to come out. And it also meant that in the second half of the war, when the conscientious objectors are making their decisions where to go. They come into the stretcher bearer corps and it brings an influx of more educated men. Um, and I would think, again, it's almost impossible to say because we just don't have the primary, the volume of primary source material. But I think that gives it the impetus for the role to be developed even further because suddenly there are men like Coltman but, but many others who've had some education but who've thought, I wish, by then the war's going on for a long time, I want to go and serve at the front but I want to do so within my understanding of, of, of my conscience. So they are an absolutely crucial component in this. <laughs> and the Quakers have really great um, records. The, the Quakers have, they, 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 they quite often, if you go up to Quaker House to do research, particularly there's a lot of uh, Quakers on ambulance trains. I think there are, there are two or three ambulance trains that are paid for by the Friends Ambulance Unit. And they have newsletters. And Quaker newsletters are a screen. They're really funny. I had just had no idea that Quakers, I thought they would be a bit Swiss UN don't smoking ICRC. <laughs> but they're really not. They're really very funny. Um, and I, I'm, I keep hoping for somebody to publish Quaker humour on ambulance trains in the Great War. But maybe it's going to be a tough sell. I'm going to go with that one. Yeah. Um, the father of a girlfriend of mine, Many years ago now. <laughs> and he was a 15 year old stretcher bearer. Mm -hmm. And he never talked about it all the time. I was going mm -hmm. out with his daughter um, until towards the end of our relationship. Mm -hmm. And one day I just said to him, What's the worst experience is yeah. for you? And he said, The worst thing was having to prioritise. You go out into no man's land, it is littered with wounded men. And they weren't given any guidance, he said, mm. as yeah. to who to attend first, yeah. second, third. Yeah. So he said it was very much a lottery. Mm. Um, he did go on actually to be a successful businessman. 
it seems to be, I think I can start to make a case for <coughs> joining the Stretch of Error Corps is an agent of what we would say in academic history, it's an agent of social mobility. Um, people join the Stretch of Error Corps, and, they, and part of the reason that they join it, particularly from 1916 onwards, is because it's a really useful bit of training. And they think, well, if I'm going to have to go in the army, I'm going to get some decent training. So they join the Stretch of Error Corps, they get their useful training, and when they come back, <coughs> the next generation go to university or go to college. So I have this in my department. I work in the Centre for Blast Injury Studies at the Imperial College, so I hope it's kind of all coming together while I do this. And our department was founded by Professor Jonathan Klosper, who is an orthopaedic surgeon, who was out in Afghanistan uh, um, in 2009, 2010, who saw the emergency that was blast injury. And he came back and said, we're going to need more than just really well-trained orthopaedic surgeons. We're going to need to do some science to understand this. And his grandfather was a stretcher bearer from the mines. And he said his grandfather, who was killed at Passchendaele, but he said after my grandfather had joined, who'd, who'd survived until 1917, the family thought, well, you know, he was nearly a doctor. And, and within a generation, you have an orthopaedic surgeon who's a professor at Imperial College. <coughs> That's not uni the uniform experience of everybody stretcher bearing, but it appears to be something that, that mm. gives an impetus within a family that wouldn't be there if it was the ordinary military service. Mm. But thank yes, it's the, it's the choosing, it's triage. Mm. Yes. Two questions. Um, how were they deployed? I mean, would you have a certain number of stretcher bearers attached to a regiment? Do they have an area of the front to cover? Um, yes. Did the enemy respect their role? Um, there, was, there were 16 increased to 32 in big offensives. So you had 16 per battalion, um, at 32 in offensives, and so they covered wherever the battalion covered. But once the battle had started, it was generally very difficult to get back to your battalion. So they, they picked up whoever they had and hoped they could make sense of the system. Um, the stretcher bearers went out during the day. Um, they also went out at night, mainly to collect the dead, to, co to collect residual wounded and dead. And there was an informal arrangement between British and, and, and German sides that you didn't shoot at people who were, on, who were in no man's land at night. Everybody, both sides, shot at bearers uh, during the day. A bearer party of four with a casualty was a very large, slow-moving target. Uh, and we have a number of accounts from patients where either bearers are picked off in, uh, one by one by a sniper, or where the bearer party is blown to pieces by a large shell because the gun uh, is, is too far back for them to see that this slow lumbering brown thing isn't a, isn't a, isn't a van, a supply van. And we both did that, there was no, there was no discretion. Um, but at night, things were safer. Sorry, I'm going to go that gentleman and then you, that's okay. Yeah. Recognising, you, you mentioned psychological casualties. Yes. And recognising that cowardice may be another form of psychological casualty. Do we have any incident of uh, charges of cowardice amongst the stretcher bearers? Not as far as I know. It's relative, it is lower than people think. Um, people were executed for criminal, uh, I think the most of people were executed either for, because they were suspected as spies or, or for the theft. So it is, a, it is a slightly less, it's a lower number than people think. As far as I know, none of them were stretcher bearers. Okay. Yeah. Yes. What was the life expectancy? We have no idea. We have no idea. We don't know how many people were stretcher bearers. We don't know if how many were injured, and we don't know how many were killed, because nobody thought to collect the numbers. What we do know is that during the Battle of the Somme, 400 members of the Royal Army Medical Corps, from, from field surgeons to wound orderlies and stretcher bearers, were admitted to temporary psychological units during the battle. Um, these were forward. But we don't know if that's all. That's the only, we have that number. 400 people were bad enough to be invalided temporarily to, to um, frontline psychological units, but we don't know who they are. We just have no numbers. Yes. Um, Sorry. Um, I've often heard it said by the veterinary profession uh -huh. that the medical profession, human medical profession, is very slow to use a lot of um, procedures that are used by... Uh, vets, is the army medical profession, uh, do they use procedures such as the super vet on uh, ITV <laughs> <laughs> and, other, and other vets worldwide? 
No, and there's very strong, there's very clear lines now between the vets and the army, on the army medical services, particularly in Afghanistan. Um, I remember being told by Chinook crews, so the Mert crews who would pick up patients in the desert and bring them back on the Chinooks. Quite often, the, the sniffer dogs or the, do the dogs that were being used in the front line would get heat stroke. And if they were brought back on the Chinook, the, the Mert teams were specifically forbidden from putting lines in because that was the job of the vet. So I don't think that happens much in the, in the army space, but I have to tell you that my department works with SuperVet a lot, because SuperVet's prosthetic designs are really cool, um, and he tries out anything. He's particularly good at joints, so we have him along to conferences, and we work a lot with him. We have to be a bit careful about putting, we got this from the super vet in our medical general hospitals. <laughs> but he's, a, he's someone who thinks really creatively about how you replicate movement using prosthetics. So, Yes, the answer is in a way, kind of. But why is it that the uh, medical profession is resistant to trying new things like that? You would have thought that wounded uh, soldiers were just the sort of person you would want to try. It. I'm not sure they are resistant. Well, in fact, I'm pretty sure they are. They are um, that they aren't resistant, particularly when you're looking at point of wounding and 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 through to critical care. Uh, in Afghanistan in the 21st century, particularly from 2009, when you start having the IED explosions, these are the kinds of injuries that people in trauma units here just didn't see very often in their units. But in Afghanistan, they saw it every day. And Field Hospital Camp Bastion, after it becomes a, a permanent, it becomes a hard field. It, it looked like a, a World War I field hospital until 2009 when it's converted to being a hard field. It has a 98% survival rate from injuries that previously everybody thought were fatal, which you wouldn't have treated. The stretcher bearer would have said, we leave them behind. It has a 98% survival rate if you can get people through the door. And it is considered to be the greatest trauma unit in British medical history. Mm -hmm. If I'm hit by anything, uh, here, I, as I'm being ca carried into a and &E, I am going to say I want whoever was at Afghanistan because they really know how to deal with trauma. So I think what we're much worse at, which is where SuperVet comes in, is understanding that surviving those kinds of injuries mean a lifetime commitment. We're bad at that end. The Army's bad at that end. <coughs> but they are phenomenal <coughs> at the front end. They really understand that. <coughs> You said that they uh, went in 30, 32 per battalion, so once they went out, was it, you said they were groups of four? A group, well, ideally groups of six, um, because you wanted one on each handle, one person monitoring the patient, and one person leading the way, but it was whoever was left, whoever got left behind. If they got split into groups of two, um, bringing back one man on a stretcher, then that was what they did. And how far would they have to carry the patient? Over? <coughs> it would be anything from 100 yards to a mile. Um, and they reckon it's a mile an hour. Uh, if, if the line moves and, and the, the enemy pushes back and suddenly you, your lines <coughs> go back, then bearers have to come back to where those lines are now. So they have to keep a constant sense of where the front line is. So with the rate of casualties, I mean... They must have been working 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. All the VCs, Coltman's VC, is always about carried wounded under fire for four days without stopping. That's what the stretcher bearer VCs are. <coughs> carried wounded for three, four, five days without stopping. <coughs> despite wounds them to themselves without stopping. And in their post unassisted for five days without stopping. That's exactly it. Sorry. Can I comment on your description of hands and stretcher bearers? Mm. In my experience, going back a couple of decades now, I was involved in a later exercise in Germany. Terrible weather, a tented hospital. And we used, the stretch bearers we used were bandsmen. Yes, sir. Yeah. We had something like 800 admissions to this hospital over a period of five days. The collapsed rate of bandsmen was very high. Mm. Their hands were torn to shreds. It's very interesting. They mm. lost weight, mm. and they were for all. Most of them were from. It was a, a reserve mm. hospital, mm. so they were from clerical jobs and so on. Mm. And so their hands were not the hands of miners, no. of course. No. And I had never really put together it's uh, holding uh, that handle. Yes. Absolutely. What it must have been like. Mm. And we had to treat some of these bandsmen in the hospital. Yes, really. Because really. they collapsed uh, after, because they had 12 hour shifts. Yes. 
and, and ha the stretches are heavier in themselves. And yes. Getting into ambulances, getting into the wards, getting them really physically demanding. And outside in the weather, it's yeah. muddy and so it was horrendous. Exactly. And we had never actually considered looking after the stretch of the bearers. Nobody ever thinks about that. But thank you, no. that's a really interesting story. Yeah, it, 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 nobody ever thinks about the stretch bearers. You will now go, won't you? I <laughs> <laughs> promise. Yes. We talked about building a British army. Yes. What were, the, were there any significant differences from the, how the Germans ran their medical teams and how they ran their stretcher bearers? Apart from the recruitment, was much <coughs> yeah. better and it started with yeah. them we nicking it. Yes. Um, yeah. What was the relationship? Was there a relationship between the two services? Because like, presumably they met in the, in, at night in the no man's land. It, it is a, this is a very British success story. Um, uh, the German system, the entire German system is different. Uh, ours is determined by lots of things, but partly by the channel. So the, uh, we know that if we're going to have really bad casualties, we're going to have to get them back across the channel, so we are going to have to treat them in France. In Germany, the assumption is that you can always have the railway line, so really bad casualties can be brought a very long way back on German trains before they need to receive surgery. The second a significant structural difference is that when Alfred Keogh is recruiting uh, regimental medical officers in 1914, he will only take people who are between 35 and 40. He said he, doesn't, he won't, doesn't, won't take medical students. Um, he needs people who are qualified, uh, not too set in their ways, and prepared to reform the system. The Germans allow anyone to be an RMO, but they allow medical students to be stretcher bearers. And they also allow medical students to be RMOs. And this means that you have a class of people in the front line who are simply not professionally capable of implementing wholesale reform. So the casualty evacuation system that is underpinned by, by British stretcher bearers is simply not there in, in, on the German side. You have bearers who carry, who hopefully get the patient to a railhead, and then the railhead will get them to a German town that will then be very well equipped. It will have a special, possibly a specialist unit, it will have a specialist siding, all that pre preparation is very good. But I am assuming that their survival rates were greatly diminished because they didn't have that point of wounding care. Mm. Also different in France. In, in France, stretcher bearers are by and large from, drawn from the religious orders. So you have what the idea of what you call the Brett Brancardier, the priest uh, stretcher bearer. So it's monks and priests um, and elderly um, mm. uh, civilians who become stretcher bearers, but again, no facility to train them in point of wounding care. Everyone else, except the Brits, and then the, and the Americans when they come because they learn, uh, has this idea of a trained stretcher bearer call for everyone else's portion. So it's significantly different. There was a question there, then I want to stop. Sorry. Am I right in thinking that Gandhi was a stretcher bearer? Gandhi was a stretcher bearer. Gandhi was a stretcher bearer in Mesopotamia. Um, so it's a slightly different, well it's not a slightly, it's a very different deal on the Eastern Front. Uh, so this, the, just, the system that I've described is really a Western Front system. But he's such a little chap. Yeah, exactly. he was, I think he was a registered conscientious objector actually. Um, and so he could do that, he could do that. Um, and so, but he was quite strong. Quite strong. Um, so he could do that, but Mesopotamia looks, uh, Mesopotamia, well, Gallipoli is different, but the Eastern Front, the Eastern Battles, look rather more like conventional earlier 20th century, 19th century battles, in that you still have this huge problem with disease. Um, uh, so anyone who's nursing is nursing with cholera wards. Um, that's not what they're going to do <coughs> on, on the Western Front, of course, until uh, the beginning of, 19, at the end of 1917 when the flu comes, and that's a different kettle of fish. A lot of cool flu books coming out. Any second. Don't squeeze one more in. Okay. <laughs> when were nurses first introduced into the theatre? Uh, nurses start coming out from the beginning of 1915. They're, they are in the front. They're in the field hospitals in the front line from 1915. But they are out there from the very first days. They're in the, the network of hospitals set up along the French coasts. Uh, Mrs. Pankhurst suspends uh, the campaign of female suffrage during the war and she exhorts women to prove their fitness for citizenship by other means and the primary means is by becoming a nurse and going to France. Um, so you have, again, it's a generational thing, coming into the field hospitals, seeking frontline service, seeking to be members, seeking to work at these hospitals that are three to five miles away from the fighting. Um, that is a very particular and extraordinary class of nurse. Couldn't have run it without. 
We'll have to draw a line under it then. Uh, no. I mean, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I wrote down a whole load of questions. Sorry, Jane. <laughs> no, that's all right. Is Most of them came up, actually, because yes. was great. Did you have a stretch bear in your family? Yes, I did, yeah. And that's one thing that um, we talked to Emily about before. I had uh, an uncle. Uh, I never met him. He got his medals, which uh, we showed to Emily. Uh, he, was, he tried to enlist at the age of 15. Didn't make it into, the, into um, a fighting unit, but became a stretcher bearer at the age of 15. But the trauma of what he went through uh, made him lose, well, I mean, he went to pieces. Suppose you say he had a nervous breakdown or post-traumatic stress disorder or whatever, and disappeared, and have absolutely no idea what happened to him at all. And I think the strain that those people went through must have been quite extraordinary. But a fascinating talk. Um, it held me absolutely riveted. I do recommend Emily's book. <laughs> whether, whether you get it decided or not, it's worth it. And if any of you are so mean as not to buy it, you can borrow mine. Yeah. <laughs> I also think it might it'd be interesting to read the book about uh, written by Harry Parker. Do you know yes, I, um, Harry Parker is a, uh, so Harry Parker has written a book called Anatomy of a Soldier. Yeah. Mm. And he's a great mate of mine. <clears throat> it, that is absolutely fascinating too. He, of course, is uh, Nick Parker, one of Nick Parker's sons, um, who was uh, he was out in Afghanistan as a commander out there. So, uh, again, a, a book well worth reading because if you read Emily's book and then you read what Harry Parker's written, you, you get a, an idea of the way that the, the system has developed from, from what it was. But absolutely fascinating. You have well deserved a glass of wine. And I like it. Thank you very much indeed.